some, we were here a lot. So, but something entered, um, a couple told me that they had just read it and they really, it was very helpful to them. And I told them that, that morning, before I sent it out, I reread it just to make sure it's all ready to go. And I said to myself, well, you know, Scott, that's a pretty good one, <laughs> you know, because I've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these things, right? So let me just, let me just start with that, because maybe it'll set the stage for what we're doing here. What must Monday morning have been like for Jesus' disciples? On Friday afternoon, Jesus had been crucified by the Romans, and the disciples had gone into hiding, fearful of being swept up by the Romans. Then, on Sunday, some of the women who had gone to finish laying out Jesus' body for burial had come telling amazing stories about an empty tomb and a living Jesus. And then... On Sunday evening, evening, Jesus had come to the disciples himself, alive, in the flesh, not a ghost, not even like someone brought back from the dead. No, Jesus had been bodily resurrected. He was himself, though not quite the same as before, not a ghost, but the resurrected, alive again, walking, talking Jesus. He could appear inside a closed room, stepping from God's dimension. He could eat fish, but it was still Jesus. Surely they awoke on Easter morning, joyful and confused, excited and bewildered, joyful and excited because Jesus, their beloved master and teacher, lived, confused and bewildered because none of it made any sense to them. The resurrection of the dead was part of a larger package. Messiah, liberation, victory, judgment, the bodily resurrection of the dead, God's return, the new heavens and the new earth, and more. The Jews often referred to this whole package as the day of the Lord, and its coming meant the arrival of God's kingdom and the fulfillment of all God's promises. It meant the beginning of heaven on earth. So try to imagine for a moment that you are Peter. You wake up on Easter morning, perhaps half expecting that you'll stumble outside to find the resurrection of the rest of the dead underway and Jesus sitting in triumph over all Judea. But you quickly realize that the world on Monday looks pretty much as it did on Sunday and Saturday and Friday and Thursday. The dead are still in their graves, with the exception of Jesus. There's still plenty of sickness and tragedy. The Romans still stand and watch over the temple. To all outward appearances, the world was unchanged, and the day of the Lord had not arrived. But of course, Peter also knew that Jesus had been resurrected the day before. What did it mean? And we're going to want to talk about these things in this series. So let's begin with the claim. Now, to understand the claim, we got to get straight something that I didn't really understand for way too much of my life. It was the way Jews buried people. Because I went to church most of my life. I was an acolyte in the Episcopal Church. Oh my gosh, I was there on Sundays. I had the robe, I would carry the crucifers. When the bishop showed up, I was the one chosen to assist him. And I had to get training for that. Yeah, so, you know, I heard a lot of sermons, went through uh, what we call confirmation in the Episcopal Church, catechism in the fourth grade. Um, but, when I came to the burial, I asked, well, how are people buried? How do we bury people? We dig a hole in the ground, in they go, and the dirt goes on top of them, right? So I never really quite understood what the deal was with the, like the rolling stone and all that. What does that have to do? I couldn't make those things fit together. In fact, I didn't even really try. I had in my head how people were buried. I let the other, it just kind of went in one, eye, in one eye and out the other. 
I think that's how a lot of people are when it comes to the Bible. You come to the Bible knowing quite well what you expect to find, and guess what? You find it, right? So, how were people buried? Now, this is Jesus' day, maybe a hundred years before, to no more than a hundred years after. When a Jew of Jesus' day was buried, the family would take the body, wrap it, and then carry it into some kind of cave or maybe a tomb that had been carved out. A lot of the area around there is limestone. And if you know your limestone, <laughs> you know that it's easily carved, it's easily cut up by water, it's, there's all kinds of caves and everything. The, uh, the Qumran community took advantage of that when they were hiding the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the family would bring the body, and they would wrap it, and they might put some, maybe if they had the money, they would put a few aromatic things around it because it was going to lay there, and it was going to smell. And the body would lay in that tomb on a shelf, on the floor, on a shelf carved out of the floor, until such time as the flesh had all decomposed away and they could come back in and all they would find would be bones, okay? And then they would take those bones and they would put them in a bone box. Here's a plain old everyday bone box. I mean, it's, you know, if you travel around that part of the world, you discovered there were other cultures doing similar things. I remember seeing a bone box. If you want to know the fancy word, it's called ossuary, but it's a bone box. And it's long enough, they're, they're big enough to accommodate the longest bone in the human body, which is your thigh bone. And they would put, you know, grandma's bones in the bone box, and then they would stack them with everybody else's. And they might scratch grandma's name in the end, just so you know which bone box were her, because they were all just kind of made out of limestone. And you, there are pictures of these almost like little warehouses, one stacked upon another back in there. That's kind of what this is, right? There they go. I'm told that these kind of bone boxes are floating all around Israel for sale. In fact, I, I think there's a lot more bone boxes for sale than there were people who died. But that's, you know... <laughs> That's kind of, you know, <laughs> how many copies of the Brook Brooklyn Bridge have there been? So, bone boxes. So, that is really important you get that. Now, the one piece that's missing is, what's with the rolling stone? Well, if you have bodies lying inside a tomb in various states of decomposition, because that's what would happen. You would have, you know, un Uncle Fred... He's in there, grandma's in there, they're dying at different times, and they come out, the bones go in, but you might have several bodies in the tomb at the same time. So, what you don't want to have are, first of all, grave robbers, though that's not a big problem for your average person. There's nothing in there to steal, but it's animals. You don't want animals in, so you would cover up the entrance of the tomb with a rolling stone that could be moved back and forth so that you could enter and leave and enter and leave. The women come that morning, and when they, on that Sunday morning, and what do they find? They've come to tend Jesus' body. On Friday, they did exactly what you would think they would do. They collected Jesus' body before the Sabbath began. They hurriedly carried Jesus' body to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. All four Gospels tell you that it's Joseph of Arimathea. He's a public figure. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. So that is surely, surely true. Easy thing to check. They carry it to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, who says, I have this new tomb for my family, but go ahead, take it, use it for Jesus. So they take his body in, they lay him out, right? Put some things around, and then they're going to come back and finish the job on Sunday morning because they're not done. They had to hurry up and get done on Friday. They're going to come back on Sunday morning, fit, finish taking care of it. But when they arrive, what do they find? 
the empty tomb. This is, a, this is an essential piece of understanding this. In, the tomb is empty. Um, and from that point forward, we have a number of resurrection accounts that present claims about things that the apostles who said happened, right? When we're going to go through some of them, but, but don't imagine that they're all neatly done, you can fit them all together, they're all presenting you this nice, nice, orderly, systematic presentation of Jesus' resurrection. They're not that way. They're just telling you what happened in various places at various times. Do they tell you everything that happened? No, they don't. Okay? So let's just take a look at a few. You, you probably familiar with these. This is John's Gospel. In John's Gospel, Mary, it focuses on Mary. It doesn't really mean that there weren't other people involved, but John's focus as the narrator in this true story is focused on Mary Magdalene. And after the others leave, Mary Magdalene stays outside the tomb in this garden area, which the area would be um, just outside the temple because it had been a quarry for limestone used in the construction of the temple. So it would have been water collected around there. And it's the right time of year for water to be collected around there and things to be greener. So she sees a person who she thinks is what? The gardener. Right? I've seen it depicted in various ways. Jesus is standing behind like a potted plant, right? And so you can hardly make him out. In other ones, her back is turned to him, and it's just a voice. I don't need to visualize any of that stuff. Of, it, of course, she does not even consider that it's actually Jesus alive. Why does she not consider that? Because there was no expectation of a crucified Messiah. Okay? No, th 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 this series is an equipping series. I want you to know these things so you can talk about it with your family and your friends and other people. It, it, if if what you come to my class, all you do is, is fill your head up with stuff and it never gets anywhere else, <laughs> that's a mistake. This is supposed to hold, the whole thing's supposed to be involved here. And we Christians can be better at helping others understand. Understand. And get them pointed in the right direction. And, and fill up misconceptions. Like the simple one around how people were buried. It's not complicated, is it? The, how they buried people in Jesus' day. Just helping people see, no, that's not just a big six-foot hole in the ground that they covered up with. That's not what they did. Let me tell you what they did. Wow. Okay? So Mary comes out, and she has no expectation of meeting Jesus because there is no expectation of a crucified Messiah. None, zero, zip, 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 zip. The fact that Jesus was crucified and died meant for his followers one thing, that he was not the Messiah. This is God's Messiah we're talking about. It was derived in power and might and wonder and glory. And the fact that he ended up dead on a cross I don't care how many times Jesus said, I'm, you know, I, I could be dead and rise in three days and they won't under... All those words don't overcome their understanding that crucified a Messiah don't work together. They're deeply saddened because they loved Jesus. He was their rabbi, their master. Their teacher, they're saddened because look how the movement, if you want to think about it that way, had ended. Jesus dead on a cross. So she, she could see Jesus, maybe, and not see Jesus. Have you ever had 
I'm going to put this in the context of marriage. Have you ever had your wife hand you something and she says, here, taste this. Taste this. And you think it's X that you're about to put in your mouth, but it's really something else. Something else you like, but you don't think that's what's coming. And so you put it in your mouth and taste it and it's gross. Even though you actually like it, it's not what your brain expected. Your brain can't compute. You have to have a few minutes to, whoa, what did I just, what did you just give me? So, <laughs> right? Irregardless, it doesn't, she, she comes to Jesus. He says, it's me. And she comes and, and then she throws herself and, she, and, and he says, you know, don't hold on to me. He doesn't say that because he's like a ghost or something. What is he saying when he says, you can't hold on to me? Everything in your Bible is, not everything, much of it, is making, is, is theology. Theology. Telling you about who God is, and who Jesus is, and who you are, and what the pop. He says, don't hold on to me because sh he's going. <laughs> she can't hold on to him. He's going. Just as he told the disciples the night, evening, uh, on Friday evening, Thursday evening. I'm going. You can't come. You can't come. God's going to send another one after me, but you can't come. Now for Mary. No, don't hold on to me. You can't come. But is it Jesus resurrected? Yes, it is Jesus resurrected. Is it a ghost? No, it's not a ghost. Jesus in Luke, Jesus meets disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now they don't recognize him. Has Jesus clattered their vision a little bit? Maybe, because there's a big theology to ma be made here. When do they recognize Jesus? When he breaks the bread. Uh, when they're sitting down to eat and he breaks the bread. In this moment of what you and I really, I think, call communion. It evokes communion. He breaks the bread and then they see. But do they, in, in, the, in the time leading up to that, getting, you know, to the inn or wherever it is they are, do they think they're in the company of a ghost? No. Just a guy. Because he's not a ghost. He's not a ghost. This is the claim. This is the claim. Luke 20, the Emmaus comes from Luke 24. Early in Luke 24, um, there's the incident with the fish. That's some kind of fish. I think it's tilapia. It's supposed to be. We're going to pretend it's tilapia because I've been told that tilapia was the most common species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. But in any event, so they're all gathered eating and Jesus appears. Now let me tell you about this appearance business. It calls us to read scripture carefully. I noticed it in the call to worship today, which hinted at passing through doors it does not say jesus ever passed through a door what it says is he appeared inside a closed room which is not the same thing for my money jesus appears inside the closed room by stepping from god's dimension into ours going back and forth jesus did but when he does the disciples are freaked out, right? They're freaked out. Now, what? The, these are rational men, the disciples and rational women who were there. And they see it's Jesus. So what is their first reaction? That he's a ghost. They had in their head what ghosts were, same way you have a year in your head, how you have in your head what ghosts were. Almost all, all cultures that I know of have something like that. Ancient cultures, something like that. And in, in Homer, they're, they're shades, but it's something like that. So they, they have a word and they have an idea that would explain sort of the presence of this ghost-like apparition of Jesus. And that that is something they can wrap their brain around. 
in the book of Acts. Peter has been arrested, and there's a knock at the door, and it's Peter, and they all think he's dead. So their first reaction is, well, that's Peter's ghost out there. No, not with Peter, and here with Jesus. And he says to them, when you go home, look up Luke 24, broiled fish. He says, look, hand me some, of, I'm, I'm, I'm not a ghost. I'm flesh and blood. Hand me some, some fish. Do you think he's doing that because he's hungry? Well, maybe he is hungry. I don't, I, I don't know, right? Maybe he is hungry, but that's not the point. The point is he eats the fish to demonstrate to them that he is not a ghost. He is a flesh and blood. Is it the same flesh and blood exactly as he had before? No, because he has been resurrected. He has gone through death to a life after death to a life after life after death, newly embodied life in a body that is, as Paul would write, imperishable won't deteriorate, but I'll expand on that. Okay, so we have, here we go. Here is, this is one painting, I don't know where this came from, when Jesus is basically offering his wounds, but I like this one. This is Caravaggio. You know, when I, 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 I like to go through images and stuff when I'm working on things like this and seeing what's out there and trying to find something Caravaggio is always powerful, the way he used light and dark. And here is Thomas at Jesus' invitation, sticking his finger right into Jesus' side. Now, a couple of points to be made. Is this Jesus? He's got the same wounds. Is he flesh? Poke it in there and see. Right? Why does Jesus do this? Because we need to understand, they need to understand. Jesus knows that there was no expectation of a crucified Messiah. He knew that the path he was walking was unique and singular and completely shocking and unexpected that the power and strength of victory and victory of God would be demonstrated through the weakness of death on a cross. That's when you see what strength really is. Not in the world's eyes, but in the world's eyes, that's weakness. You lost, and that's for God. That's what strength is. In John's Gospel, the disciples have gone back up into Gal the Galilee, and they are at the Sea of Galilee, and some time has passed, and they're out fishing, because that's what they did, right? You meet the disciples, and they're fishers of fish. <laughs> fishers of fish, right? And so they're out in their, in their little boat, and they look on the shore, they see some figure out, out there, right, on the shore. And he's kind of, I love the way Tussaud does this. He, you know, Jesus is, oh, come on, man. Got a little campfire going, smoke's going up. Somebody's cooking for him. Yahoo. And then they realize it's Jesus. And in the water they go, and they come there. Jesus has this breakfast with them. He just has breakfast with them. He cooks for them. He surely eats with them. He does have a nice point to talk with Peter, but still, these are stories of resurrection. Now, what does resurrection really mean? That we, there are a couple of ways in the Greek that this is expressed. One is by simply, the, simply using the word to raise up. Okay, um, but it's not a it's it, it, it's not a peculiar term. It just means raise up. This word, anastasis, which is also used to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, is actually the word meaning resurrection. That's how it was used. 
Now, did people, did folks think that people were resurrected? No. As I heard Arthur say, I don't know, maybe it was last Wednesday night, dead people stay dead. Of course they do. It's no secret. Dead people stay dead. But they, you could imagine it, right? So the Greeks had a word for it, anastasis, resurrection. And that's what we're talking about with respect to Jesus. So, hmm. Now, so here's, here's a little thing you could plant in your brain. It's so clever. It's from N.T. Wright. He has, such a, he has a gift for these kind of little phrases. That you and I enjoy life. When we pass, we will enjoy a life after death. And then we will enjoy a life after life after death. The life of resurrection. Newly embodied. So we can enjoy the new heavens, the new earth that God will bring. So Jesus, he lived, he died, he enjoyed a life after death for a short period, and then come Sunday, his life after, life after death, this resurrected never to go back and taste death again, passing through death to the other side, no going back, no going back. Now, in the Bible, there are various stories of people being brought back to life. In the Old Testament, Elisha lies across the body of the widow's son and prays to God, and the son is brought back to life. Lazarus, Lazarus. Here, coming out of the tomb, dead four days to make sure he was actually dead, dead, and dead. Is he resurrected? No. Okay, we're going to do this together. No. Is Lazarus resurrected? No. no. Again, is Lazarus resurrected? No. no. He is resuscitated. He's brought back to life. It's like somebody who dies on the operating table. They put the paddles on him, and they bring him back. Lazarus will go on, did go on, and age, do whatever the rest of his life was going to be, and then die. A second time. Hmm. That was true of the widow's son. That's true of Lazarus. It'll be true of a woman named Tabitha. That Peter will bring the power of God to, and she is brought back to life because the widow's in her town are terrified. She took care of them, and now she's died, and she comes back to life. Perhaps that power was even brought to Paul to bring back to life a boy. I think he's pretty much a boy, who, as Paul is droning on and on and on, hour after hour, midnight, one, two, three, a boy, a young man who falls out of a window, asleep, to the ground below, dead. Yeah, I think probably dead. But he is brought back to life. That's, that's, what, that's what the Huzis are. I did not get this for a long time. I have to tell you. I can remember a few conversations from my life when I couldn't really differentiate between Lazarus and Jesus, in terms of what happened to them. If you can't do that, you will be forever lost in this. You will make no progress at understanding the resurrection if you don't understand that Lazarus is brought back to life like on an operating table. But Jesus is resurrected, anastasis. Jesus is resurrected through death to new life and to this life after life after this, this really, this, this, this newly embodied life. Um, here it is plainly again. I can't, I, I don't know how to say it more plainly than that. This is what you got to equip yourself with. This is not, I mean, it isn't really hard. I mean, it's not intellectually, I mean, it's, I guess it's, 
challenging in the biggest sense of the word. But just to understand that resurrection is not resuscitation itself, to understand that Lazarus will go back to his old life, get old and die, but Jesus passes through all that in a newly embodied life, never to taste death again because God's victory over sin and death was won. That, okay, we can explain. You can explain to somebody. You could have explained it to me years ago if somebody had explained it to you. So this is what we need to be able to do. All right? Now, still more about the claim. Okay. So that's enough for today about Jesus. Now let's talk about us, because we like to talk about us, right? Yeah, I want to talk about us. Okay, so what's the deal for you and me? Again, something nobody ever told me. I grew up in the church. Nobody ever explained this to me. That one day I would be resurrected just as Jesus was resurrected. It's exactly what Paul says. Jesus is the first, the rest will follow. What's true of Jesus will be true of us. Wow, wow, why did nobody tell me these things? Why did nobody explain to me for way too much of my life that when I stood, starting as the dutiful acolyte, okay, saying the Apostles' Creed, that when I got to the last line there where I'm talking about the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, that I'm talking about my body, your body, our bodies, not Jesus. He's handled earlier in the creed. This is us in that line, the resurrection of the body. It is this proclamation to the world, the claim that when Jesus returns, and he will, and God's new heavens and new earth are ushered in, that the dead will be raised bodily, and that we will enjoy this new heavens and new earth bodily, not little floating spirits kind of floating around. When I was a kid, I have to tell you, I had in my head that when people died, and you know, if you ended up in the good place, sort of the up escalator as opposed to the down escalator, if you got the up, up escalator and you'd, you'd go up there, you know, and you'd, you'd of course you would be given wings, Right, yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but you'd be, have a lot of robes on and a hymnal and you'd be singing hymns and listening to music. And, and sure, of course, we're going to, to enjoy life everlasting with God, living in God's unmediated presence, yes. But when I was a kid, it always sounded boring. <laughs> and I think it's because there are key pieces of this that I left out when I was a kid. When God creates the world in six days and rests on the seventh, what does God say every day? It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. The physicality of our world is good. It is broken. It is damaged by human rebellion against God, Genesis 3. But Romans 8, Paul writes, all creation groans awaiting its redemption. It doesn't mean the physicality is bad or weak or as the Gnostics would have you believe, made by some, some weak, evil, secondary God. No, the physicality of this world was made by God and if nothing else, resurrection is the proof of that. Jesus is bodily resurrected and so shall we be to enjoy everlasting life with God in the unmediated presence of God but with one another. What are the two great commandments? That we would love God and love others. Love God and love others. So what is the promise of resurrection? That we will love God and love others. So I firmly believe the Bible teaches that one day I will hug my mother again or my granddad 
That is God's way. That is the God I meet in the pages of Scripture from beginning to end. From beginning to end. So, will we have bodies? Yes. Will we be able to eat fish? Yes. Jesus does. Will I be able to eat other things? <laughs> I think so, yes. Can I eat all that without gaining weight? I hope so, yes. <laughs> you know, how many parables does Jesus tell about banquets and, and the rest of it, right? This whole abundance, abundance, abundance of God. Well, okay, super. You know, the, most of the questions I get asked about our life after death or even about resurrection, they're not questions I can answer. We, all we have is what we have in Scripture, and Scripture does not want to talk to us about our life after death. What Scripture wants to talk to us about, about is our life after, life after death, and even then, not much. So I always tell people, just pack it with as much goodness as you want. If you, if you want to have more hair, you'll have more hair. <laughs> Do dogs go to heaven? Sure, I love dogs. Do cats go? Open question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, this is God who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Every year what we do, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, this is God who does this. What does it say to you about the nature of God? What does it say to you about the nature of God? So anyway... Our claim of resurrection, not resuscitation, resurrection. And as Jesus was resurrected, so shall we all be resurrected. Are the resurrection appearances the only appearances that we, the Gospels, the only appearances that we know something about? No. Paul tells us Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. I wish he had told us more. He didn't, but I wish he had told us more. But what is true of Jesus shall be true of us. He is the first fruits, Paul says. The rest of the harvest is coming. The fact that it's 2,000 years is nothing. It's not, what is 2,000 years in the scheme of things, in the history of the, of the earth and the cosmos and the rest of it? So let me stop here for today because I want to stay on the claim and see if there are things that I can straighten out or answer for anybody. Questions? Joan is asking about the body. Clearly he does look like Jesus because when he shows up inside the room, they do know it's Jesus. He, is he changed? N.T. Wright coined a word, he, which he does, transphysical, to try to say it's a physical body, not the same, because these bodies we have now, how long do they last? Not everlasting. They don't last that long, right? So it is different, but would people recognize us? Sure. And if you know, that raises questions, well, take my granddad. I know my granddad as my granddad. What if he is resurrected looking like he did at 25? I might still recognize him because he was bald already at 25. <laughs> but nonetheless, so yes, we will know. Maybe God will open our eyes, but we will be ourselves. That's the key. See, when, when Jesus has Thomas touch the wounds, what is that for? This is me. This is really me. It's not like I've become somebody else. You will be Joan, and I will hug you too, my dear. Right? You will be Joan. We will still be ourselves, but resurrected and saved and reconciled with God living in the presence of God, living a life. Why, this, this is where the Old Testament is so helpful. 
right? Because in the Old Testament, you have these passages. Well, everybody sits under fig trees, and they beat their swords into plowshares, and, you know, they get to, they get to keep what they make, which is not people's experience in that ancient world, okay? And they have full bellies. People in Jesus' day, they didn't know what full bellies were. That wasn't their life. Their life was subsistence. We're used to wanting to lose weight. That wasn't the problem Jesus' peers had in Galilee and Judea. Most of them <laughs> was a fight to get enough calories. So, yeah, we, we will know. I will know my mother. Yeah. Now, there was one in the back here, too. Right. Sure. So, I, the, in, in the creeds, one way the Apostles' Creed is written in English, is that after he was raised, he descended into hell. And what's that about? Okay. So the Apostles' Creed was not written in English. The Apostles' Creed goes back to the Latin and the Greek to just 200 years after Jesus. And what did it say, actually? The Creed said, actually, descended to Hades in the Greek, which is the place where the dead are without the same connotation as p of punishment that came to be attached to that idea. And so it is misleading to just say the center to the hell because everything, he, we all picture him going down to where the pitchforks and the molten lava is or whatever you think it was as, as a kid. No, he goes to the place where the dead are. Now the phrase to talk about that is the harrowing of hell. Interesting. The harrowing of hell. And it's talking about Jesus actually going to the place of the dead, to Hades, to do what? To proclaim the good news. So they haven't missed out. That's the idea. I think that's a beautiful idea. Right? Because no, God doesn't want anybody to be left out. He doesn't want somebody to be left out just because they were born at the wrong time or, in my view, the wrong place. Um, in 1 Thessalonians, the question is, gosh, you know, my, my grandma, sh she died before all this stuff happened. Is she going to be left out of what's coming? And Paul says, no, 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 no. The dead will be raised. And then we on earth, what about us? We'll be transformed. Like if Jesus came back right now. Well, I'm not going to be raised from the dead, am I? I I'm not dead, really. I'm not dead. I'm not dead. So if Jesus, so let's just say the resurrection of the, was, of the dead was kicked off right now. 1 Corinthians 15, what would happen to me? Paul says I would be transformed in, at the sound of the trumpet, in the twinkling of an eye, and I would be given this transphysical body for the life everlasting. All these little threads, you see, can be tied together and that's what we Christians have been doing for 2,000 years is tying those threads coming from scripture and helping each other understand what God's promises really are so another question yes what are my thoughts on free will and why would humans rebel against God why would we? I don't think we will rebel against God after the resurrection. The question to me would be, well, we screwed it up the first time. Are, you, are we going to screw it up the second time? Is that kind of what you're getting at? Well, sure, because we used our free will poorly in Genesis 3, right, to eat the fruit. The question is, will we do it again? God's victory over sin and death is won on that cross. So uh, there will not be an instant replay. Now, for me, that means that we have a collective memory 
of what we did wrong before. So we don't do it again, right? Were, were, the Christ, were, Pete, were Adam and Eve predestined to, to eat that fruit? No, they chose to do it. But will, will that all just be instantly replayed over and over and over and over and over again? No, no indication of that in Scripture. That's not what it talks about at all. It's just a life everlasting with God. And so I, but I also know that for me to be me, I have to have my memories. Is that true? Right? Some of us experience that now, don't we? when we have loved ones whose memory is disappearing. They're losing a lot, aren't they? The truth is, yes, they are losing a lot. And so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to speculate about, but um, I certainly believe that we are remade into people who will make the right choice and not the wrong choice. This new birth that we are given in Christ in many ways is about making the right choice and not the wrong choice. So, anything else I can speculate about? Scott, you got hands in the middle. What? You got a couple hands right there. Right here. Two principally. One is anastasis, which is usually translated the text somewhere as like resurrected. Then there's the word raised, which is a more general word. Okay? But when resurrection is used, it just kind of focuses the mind, and it never says that Lazarus was resurrected. Anastasis is not used there because it would not be, it would not be correct. Jesus' resurrection is a singular event for now. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. Then the rest of us will follow, he says, again in 1 Corinthians and elsewhere, not just 1 Corinthians, but um, we're doing, I'm doing 2 Corinthians in my Monday class. We're coming up on a famous passage about resurrection and, and resurrection bodies and so forth. In 2 Corinthians, it's, it's, you know, that's what's so fascinating to me. This doctrine of the resurrection of the body there's never been any heresy around that. There's never been a group of Christians that said, oh, no, oh, no, no, you're wrong. Nope, it, we might get ignorant about it, but there was no heresy around it because it's just too plainly there in the New Testament writings. So one more, and then I'm going to turn it over to Patty. And I, I really can't see. Uh, I really can't. It's just what's hap sad what's happening to me. Yes. Oh, well, that one I can answer because that, was a, that, that one Scripture talks about. Okay, so here's how it works in the book of Revelation. The order of things in the book of Revelation is this. Jesus returns. The dead are raised. I'm leaving out some stuff, but Jesus returns. The dead are raised, and the names are read out of the book of Merit. And the book of merit is the book of, like, your life. Merit, what you, were, what you did, what you didn't do, acts of omission, acts of commission. That's one book. If that were the only book, we would be out of luck. Right? Because we've all done things we regretted doing. We've all failed to do things we regretted failing to do. All of us. Nobody's exempt from that. There's a second book, though, that follows the book of merit. That is the book of life. And the names found in the book of life are those who will go on to spend eternity with God. One slide behind me. And those whose names are not found in the book of life will not spend eternity with God. And we could have a long talk about dif different viewpoints that Christians have about what happens with those folks, um, but in any, that's not what I want to do. 
So, um, yeah, so see that? Those pieces are there because the, the, the point in Revelation is that God's people in the book of life, God's people enumerated there in the book of life, will spend eternity with God. So we proclaim in the creed the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting with God. And those who are not in the end counted among God's people will not share life, but out life everlasting. But everybody's resurrected. All of the dead. What? Yes. Now, when you, is there an opportunity after the grave to become a believer? I think so. Nobody's taken that away from me yet that I can find in Scripture anyway. But that, that is the differentiation because the people of God are the ones who spend eternity with God. So who do you want to be counted amongst? The people of God. Exactly. All right. So, wow. When we come together, together next week, we're going to move into the significance of the resurrection of Jesus. And that is more profound than you think, okay? The significance of the resurrection of Jesus. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my lovely bride. Okay, thank you. Um, got a few prayers online today. A prayer from Mike Kelly for his nephew, Zach. Um, Zach was in a single vehicle accident earlier this week, but he has two skull fractures and two compound fractures. So he is in serious shape. We need to pray for him. A prayer of joy from Jamie Lee. Over the last few weeks, um, I've been saying Jamie was praying for her daughter, young daughter, who had heart issues with a couple young children, and Jamie had been babysitting. The good news is, I mentioned again a couple weeks ago, she had some sort of procedure, and joy is now that she's had an excellent report from a heart doctor. Her pain is gone. So that is all a wonderful thing. Um, prayers for peace and comfort for the passing of Missy Dean's dad, Brent Augenstein. Prayers for Sharon Kerr, who will have a full body scan this week to check for more cancer. Also, she will have two more radiation treatments this week, and so far, no side effects. And that was from Bob. Both Bob and Sharon are here today. They both really need our prayers. Um, many of you, if you didn't see it on Facebook, Bob had a heart attack on Easter Sunday, and we are very lucky to have him here with us today. He had a stent put in and has other stents, I think, to come, um, but let's just thank God that he got through that heart attack and um, whew, that he's here, like I said. you know, I know it's been very, very stressful for the both of them. Um, prayers for Ben King. Many of you have asked me about Ben King. Um, ben King is the shorter guy with the cowboy hat. And um, unfortunately, uh, Ben is back in the hospital. Um, he is at UT Southwestern. Uh, Scott and I spoke to him and his uh, partner, Debbie Joe a few times this week. They're hoping to come up with some type of treatment for him. Please pray for him. He's very weak, very tired, not feeling well at all. So let's keep him in our prayers. Um, this is just a prayer for ear pain and neck pain. Prayers of healing for Kathy Sutherland, who's recovering from pneumonia. And I did not know that. So thank you, Sean, for handling everything today. Prayers for Tom Lytle. He is scheduled for a heart uh, procedure, two stents, this Thursday at Baylor Heart. Please pray for a successful outcome. And that was all the prayers I had on the notes if you would just go to God in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day and for this opportunity, God, to come together and learn more about your word, God, and, and really learn the differences, God, of resurrection and recitation and hopefully, Lord, be able to explain this to others when they ask us. We pray, God, today that you would hold each of us close, God, in this coming week. And as God said in his sermon this morning we often don't feel God with us but it is us that has moved away that God is steady and is always there with us always there Lord we pray that as this week goes on you would watch over each one of us our family our friends 
we continue to pray, God, for those people, the friends and family and others that we love that have not yet put their faith in Jesus. And we pray, God, for you to help us with all of our anxieties. You tell us to not worry about anything and certainly not to be worrying about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have its own problems. And yet, Lord, as humans, we, we just continue to do that all the time. Please help us with that, Lord. So, Lord, as we leave here today, watch over us, keep us safe, keep us healthy, Lord. And if possible, Lord, we pray for good weather tomorrow for the eclipse. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Adios, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.